morning, but that's that's kind of fun. And so what we're going to do in just a moment is after I've prayed and blessed the offering and uh, and prayed for our time here, uh, we're going to invite you to stand and Terry and the team are going to lead us in some songs. And while they're doing that, Lewis is, is the one man show today and he's going to receive the offering as you're standing and he's going to walk around and if he stands there in front of you for a long time, he thinks you have a little extra to give. So, we're uh, glad you're here. This is uh, just one of the, the most rewarding things we can do, right? To celebrate new life and baptism and what it really means. And, and there's nothing, and you'll hear a little more about this, there's nothing significant that happens in the act of baptism itself that, that proves that you're in, in a sense. But it's an outward expression of what God has already done uh, inside the heart. And it's just a real neat experience to be able to celebrate that uh, together. And so we're glad you're here this morning. Uh, the only announcement that I have is next Sunday, Jesse and Celinda, our missionaries in Mozambique, are going to be with us uh, for our morning worship gathering. And we'd invite you to come. And we're having uh, another agape meal, another potluck uh, afterwards uh, when they're with us. And so come and hear what God is doing in their hearts and lives, uh, and that's next Sunday, and then our uh, Back to Church Sunday is uh, September 4th, but we'll have more information for, for you uh, next Sunday about that. So next Sunday, Jesse and Celinda, um, uh, Jesse and Celinda Van Horn will be with us, and that'll be a great Sunday. So let's pray. We're glad you're here, and glad that God has blessed us with a great day. And great weather uh, for us to celebrate these baptisms and to, to worship outside in the creation that he's given to us. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you've blessed us in, in such a powerful way. And we can't help but realize that uh, when we look across the waters of this lake, Father, and realize uh, your goodness to us. And so, Father, thank you for each one that has gathered in here this morning. We pray that as we worship you in spirit and in truth, as we sing these songs of praise and worship, as we open up your word, Father, uh, that you would speak to our hearts. God, as the offering is received this morning, we thank you for how you have just so blessed us. Um, and this is an opportunity for us to give back to you according to how you've uh, given to us. And so as we bring our tithes and offerings to you this morning, we pray that you would be pleased with, uh, with, uh, with what we bring. And we ask these things in, in your name. Amen. Just before Terry comes to lead, those of you that are visiting and our guests, uh, we're so thankful that you're here to be able to celebrate with loved ones. And uh, just, I want to make it clear, you're under no obligation to give. This is for our church family to, uh, to give to, for according to what God has done. And so God bless you. I hope you enjoy your morning uh, with us. And then uh, the afternoon as we get to spend some time around fellowshipping around the table. Terry, God bless you as you come and lead us. Why don't you change your position and stand up? And that'll make it easier to dig into the pockets to, as uh, Lewis comes around for the offer. Good to have everyone here. Last week I had the cold, I guess you'd call it. There's a difference between the cold and the flu bug, so I couldn't hardly talk. Charlene led. This week I'm leading because she's got a cold and she can't hardly talk. So, uh, anyhow, I always enjoy baptisms, and I don't want to take long talking, but. One baptism, I can't remember who was doing the baptizing, and so on. And one of the guys, they held him under quite a while, and he said, well, I just wanted to make sure, <laughs> you know. So look out with Sean. I don't know if he may keep you. No, I'm just joking here, I'm sure. But baptisms is always an exciting time, and I just enjoy baptisms because it's showing that here's a person that has decided to leave the old life behind and start a new one. So I thank the Lord for each one that's here this morning. We got three songs we're going to do, and I asked Olgi to come up. I asked a couple others, but they didn't want to. But they, so I said, "Come up later if you want to." So, anyway, everybody join in and sing. Some of you have the song before you, and you probably know them by heart. So, this is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. <laughs> Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchased. 
precious of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. My Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture have burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I, in my Savior, am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. And our next song, I think you just turn your page, paper. <laughs> The only one I'm actually hearing singing up here is me. I can hear Augie a little bit. I don't hear nobody out there, but it's probably because we're camped in here. So out there, sing good and loud, okay? And they're pointing over there or something. I can't, I can't sign read. <laughs> it's that same person that gave me trouble one other time. They're saying things to me, but I couldn't figure them out. Anyway, let's do this. Uh, I got the wrong page. <laughs> she got me mixed up there. <laughs> My Jesus, I love you. <clears throat> My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee, sin I refine my gracious redeemer my savior art thou if ever I love thee my Jesus it is now I love thee because thou Yeah. 
merchant of glory and endless delight. I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright. I'll sing with a glittering crown on my brow. If One more before Pastor Sean comes. Uh, I will serve thee because I love thee. And uh, it's good to see a good number out. Seems like there's a pretty good crowd here and a good day for it. I don't know, after you get out there and get cold with water, I, I shiver when it's almost warm. So I can just go like that. So. Anyhow, <clears throat> sing this song and then Pastor Sean is going to come from there. So. I will serve thee because I love thee, for you have given life to me, for I was nothing before you found me. Well, thank you again for uh, being here, and thank you to the Saban clan for the, all the extra work on um, getting ready and making sure that uh, everything was uh, looking good as, as it is uh, for us. I want to share a few thoughts uh, this morning, and then just to give you, some of you like just to know how the order of things are going to work. And so what we'll do is, after I'm done sharing a few thoughts about baptism, we're going to get those that, have, that are going to be baptized uh, to come up here. Um, and you can sit along the deck, and one by one, we're going to do the uh, the asking of the questions and, and that type of thing right here, uh, so you all can hear. If we go down there and do that, there'll be a lot of you that, that won't be able to hear. And so we'll do all of that at, at the same time, not talking at the same time, but one by one uh, up here, and uh, then we'll go down to the water uh, one by one after that. We've been in this series, and this is actually the final Sunday of this series, Summertime Blues, and so the question becomes, when we're looking at Old Testament prophets, is what does God's Word have to say about baptism in the Old Testament? And actually, you'd be surprised how much is in the Old Testament that sets up for what the baptism really meant and the cleansing process and all of that that we'll experience. And so I want to take a few thoughts from Ezekiel, kind of to set this all up as to why we believe baptism is so important. What is it that actually transpires in our lives and in our heart that, that makes this uh, such an important uh, event? And, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a traditionalist sometimes, and I just don't think there's any better way than enjoying a baptism when you're outside in a lake. Uh, I've been to baptisms in churches before, and they're fine too, and God's Spirit was there. But there's just something about being outdoors that, that brings that all in together. 
And so this morning, as, I, as we think about Ezekiel, uh, I want to set Ezekiel's story up a little bit and then read uh, the text from Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel's ministry as a prophet spanned 22 years uh, between 593 B.C. and 571 B.C. So for those of you that, that like history and the historical context of where Ezekiel was, that's where he fell. He was among the youngest Jews that were exiled to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. And so he was really, really young. Uh, probably even younger than a teenager uh, when he got when they were exiled there and his ministry was to confront the people of God with the reality that their exile would not soon end imagine that if that was your job to remind God's people that what you're going through right now it's not going to end for a long time that was his primary job and one of the saddest passages I think in all of scripture is written in chapter 24 where Ezekiel is told by God that the delight of his eyes will be taken from him and within 24 hours his wife passes away. And it's just it's so much sadness and here you have, when you think of these, as we've been studying that these prophets of God, they had rough days, they had rough patches in their lives, their lives were not perfect. And this is the message he gets from God. And Ezekiel informs the people of God that their delight, Jerusalem, is going to be taken away from their eyes. And that is exactly what happens in their context. He, God uses that as an illustration for him to be able to share with his people, just like his wife had been taken from him, that Jerusalem was going to be taken from them. And in chapter 15, Ezekiel has used a parable about a useless vine, which bears no fruit and is too twisted to build with, to inform the people of their worthlessness to God and the coming judgment that is coming that if they don't get their act in order. And the people do not believe him because they think that simply because they're God's chosen people that life is all good. And sometimes we can have a tendency to fall into that camp that just because I go through the right motions, I show up at church when I think I should show up at church or because of my godly heritage, God won't really... Um, uh, not allow me to uh, enter into heaven but the Bible is so clear that God will honor and respect the choice and the decision that we make here on earth and so if we decide to to choose Christ and to choose to honor him that one day when we die he'll honor that decision and allow us to enter heaven but if, he, if we choose not to follow him one day when we die he will honor that decision as well and say well why why would you want to spend eternity with me in heaven you didn't want to ch you chose not to uh, choose me while you're here on earth and so that was ezekiel's whole message and the people didn't believe him and the reality is is they are about to learn is so different that being born into an israelite nation is not sufficient and just because we're born into the right family and just because we're born into what i believe is is the greatest country in the world that's not sufficient and just because we do some good things isn't sufficient in order to earn God's favor. And so we come to chapter 16, and uh, it points out the, the glory of God's grace. And in the midst of everything that they're walking through, what God uses, and this is where we walk down into what, uh, what would then become the baptism uh, importance in the New Testament. And so if, if you have your text with you, or your, your Bibles, your phones, or tablets, we're in Ezekiel chapter 16, beginning to read at verse 1 of that chapter then another message came to me from the Lord son of man confront Jerusalem with her desolate sins give her this message from the sovereign Lord you are nothing but a Canaanite your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite on that day you were born on that day you were born no one cared about you your umbilical cord was not cut and you were never washed rubbed with salt and rubbed in cloth no one had the slightest interest in you no uh, no one pitied you or cared for you. On that day you were born, you were unwanted, dumped in a field, and left to die. But I came by and saw you there, helplessly kicking about in your own blood. As you lay there, I said, live. And I helped you to thrive like a plant in the field. You grew up and became a beautiful jewel. Your breast became full and your body hair grew, but you were still naked. And when I passed by again, I saw that you were old enough for love. So I wrapped my cloak around you to cover your nakedness and declared my marriage vows. I made a covenant with you, says the Sovereign Lord, and you became mine. Then I bathed you and washed off your blood, and I rubbed fragrant oils onto your skin. I gave you expensive clothing and fine linen and silk and beautifully embroidered 
uh, that was beautifully embroidered in sandals made of fine goat skin leather. I gave you lovely jewelry, bracelets, beautiful necklaces, and a ring for your nose, earrings for your ears, and a lovely crown for your head. And so you were adorned with gold and silver. Your clothes were made of fine linen and costly fabric and you were, that were beautifully embroidered. You ate of the finest foods, choice uh, flour, honey, and olive oil, and became more beautiful than ever. You looked like a queen, and so you were. Your fame soon spread through the world and became your beauty. I dressed, your, I dressed you in my splendor and perfected your beauty, says the sovereign Lord. In those verses this morning, God is dealing primarily with the city of Jerusalem. And once more, the history of, of the people of God, they have deserted their first love and they're chasing after idols and there's other things that they've made priorities. And Ezekiel paints this awful picture of what they look like. And so the first thing that Ezekiel points out here is was their wretched condition. Uh, we may have kind of winced a little bit as I was reading that text and we think of a, a baby being born and nobody to cut the umbilical cord and nobody to clean that baby off. I mean, that just would never happen in our context, in our culture. But that's exactly the mess that Ezekiel is explaining to his people that we are in when God is not part of our lives, that we are in a messed up condition. Verse 4 and 5, I want to pull these words out, that they were unclean, unloved, uncared for, unclothed, unclaimed, and uncontrollable. That's the picture that Ezekiel paints here of our brokenness before we discover Christ into our lives. But then there's a wonderful compassion that we see in verses 6 to 9. Verses 1 to 5 kind of lay out the brokenness of us. But 6 to 9 lays out the compassion of, of God coming along and wrapping his arms around uh, this, this baby that is in the, in the field. And he says to the baby, live. And in verses 6 and to 9, we get a wonderful uh, picture of the compassion of God. In these verses, God is pictured as walking past and stoops down and rescues a person from certain death. And that's certainly uh, setting us up for what Jesus would do. And there's a lot of context here and a lot of things that are going on that people in that culture uh, would have would have under, uh, would have understood. And that act of reaching down and putting a cloak over them was would be the act that a man would do to a woman to, to claim her as his and that he wanted to spend um, her, his life with them. And when we think of our brokenness and the fact that the God of this universe, the God that created this beauty, wants to reach down and put his cloak around us, and love us. That's an amazing thought. That with the six uh, billion people on the face of this earth and all the people that have ever lived in our brokenness and the things that we've done, uh, so many things that uh, certainly didn't deserve the love of God, that God chooses to walk through the field in a sense and to reach down and to put his cloak around us when we choose him. And so he washed away all the impurities of the sin and what we'll experience today really in this baptism is what God has already done in the hearts of these people that have said, I choose Christ, that God has done that cleansing and that washing away and the, the being made pure. You understand that, that that baby, that infant in the field, as Ezekiel was telling the story there, they couldn't do that on their own. And we can't do it on our own either. There's something in our culture and something within us that says, I, I can just try a little harder to clean myself up. Uh, I can just look the part uh, that I want to look, but there's something within us on our inside that is broken and that can only be fixed by God himself. Isaiah says in 118 that, that we are made as white as snow. And that's what God does. And then the third idea that I want to leave with us this morning is there's a wondrous change that transpires. When we truly encounter what God has done in our hearts and lives, there's, we, we leave change. We can't help but not. Uh, we cannot but be changed when we encounter the living true God. Uh, this little one's life would never be the same again that Ezekiel tells this story about. Uh, probably some of you know of, of people and of maybe even babies or maybe they grew to be toddlers and into childhood that get rescued from a very broken, broken, messed up home. And their life is never to be the same again. It's, it's changed forever. They get placed in a home. They get adopted by parents that love them and want to do everything they can to see that child developed and grow. And there's just something reassuring about that. And that's a picture of what happens when God transpires our life. In verses 10 to 11, this child is now clothed. She was once dirty, naked, and abandoned. 
but now she has clothes. She is clothed with the finest of garments. And when we come to Christ, uh, he gives us uh, this beauty and glory that is only fit for uh, a king and a queen. No expense was spared when God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to earth to die on a cross for us. He gave us his very best. He didn't just give us what would do. I've used this illustration uh, before, but I remember working for a, a contractor, a carpenter, and one of the phrases that he just hated to hear his workmen use is, well, that's good enough. Because good enough isn't good enough. The best is what was required. And the best is what God gave when he sent his son Jesus to earth. In verses 12 to 13, he crowns this child. The Lord looks at this woman and made her his queen, uh, which, uh, of course, is tying into what the church is and what we become uh, when we uh, accept God's love and his grace. And he literally crowned her with his glory. And he promised to do the very same thing for each one that would accept that. In Revelation chapter 4, and uh, the first 11 verses there, we won't uh, read that text this morning, but a great uh, chapter to read. We read that there will be crowns cast before him when we get to heaven. And I believe that it will be those crowns that he's reached out and he's given to us along the earth here in our cleansing process. And this morning as we celebrate baptism, it's a celebration of that. In verse 14, she was changed. There is a time when no one came to her and no one wanted anything to do with her. But he came to her and made the difference. And now she is the very envy of the world. And I think and I believe that when we truly encounter Christ, that God gives us something that becomes the envy of the world. To know that at, at the end of the day, no matter what has transpired and what has happened in, in our lives, that God's got it all handled and we can have a tremendous peace in the midst of whatever it is that is going through. There are so many people in our culture and in our world that have given everything they have for that. They've given, maybe sunk it all in a bottle, maybe in some other addiction, to try and get that satisfaction and get that peace. And the peace that God gives us becomes the envy of the world when we allow God to change our life. And so this morning you may feel, maybe you're here, and you kind of feel like what was described there, unloved and unwanted and uncared for, and that if, if life stopped today for you, you wonder if, if anybody would really even notice, would anybody even show up at, at your memorial or your funeral service? And I'm here to tell you from the, from the words of God that God cares, and God would love nothing more than to reach down. And so my challenge for all of us, and especially those that are being baptized uh, this morning, is in this picture of a, of a painted, helpless, broken person, that God has redeemed you. And one of the things that, that I uh, will say, and you may not hear this, but to give it a, a preference, is after I bought, baptize them, I'll look each of the candidates in the eye, and I will say, you guard this day, you hear. Because there will be times of adversity. There will be times when you wonder, was my commitment to Christ really worth it? Was it worth taking a stand? And I want this to be cemented in each one of the candidates. That this, they guard this day like no other day. And they remember the folks that are here to celebrate with them. And so if you're feeling unloved and unwanted and uncared for today, the Bible says today is the day of salvation that what these baptism candidates have already experienced, that you can experience today. And it would be such a shame to allow this day go by without you not experiencing that. And so just before the, the baptism candidates come, I'm going to close our time in prayer. And as I'm praying for all of you, I would invite you that if God has spoke to your heart this morning, if you're kind of feeling, yeah, I can kind of relate to that story that Ezekiel told thousands of years ago. That you would not just let that go as a passing moment or a passing thought. But you would say, God, I need to be forgiven. I need to begin a new life with you. And if you make that decision and you make that prayer, uh, we would love, and this is something I always add on, uh, if you're here and this is something for you to be thinking about and you've never been baptized before and you've given your heart to Jesus, we'd love to be able to do that today. And maybe if you give your heart to Jesus today, you're thinking, I'd like to be all in. Uh, the Bible's full of, of times and uh, in his, his word where uh, it records that, that people got saved and then they were baptized all in the same day. And we can do that. And the Bible's pretty clear that, that 
that can happen. And so let that stir within your heart as I close our time of prayer. Let's pray this morning. <laughs> Father God, I pray. I pray for each one uh, within the sound of my voice this morning, Father, that they would they would experience and know you in a in a closer and a more real way. And Father, if there would be some here this morning that are experiencing that unwantedness and unlovedness that our our society and culture can so quickly uh, bring on if we're if we're not focused on you, that we would realize that that we were created by you. And there is nothing more than that, that what you want and then for us to reach out and to begin a relationship with you and that God when we do we begin that cleansing process which uh, will will demonstrate today with the the outward expression of, of baptism what has taken place in these folks heart and then I pray for our baptism candidates that father that you would continue to cement in their hearts and minds the commitment that some of them have made a few years ago some of it some of them it's been more recent than that but Lord, that they truly would guard this day like no other. And then when times of adversity and times of challenge comes, Father, that Lord, that they would remember that there is a God that loves them. Father, that there is a church that loves them. God, there are brothers and sisters in Christ that love them. And that even in, in, in a very unfortunate situation where maybe their own earthly family would turn their back on them, Father, that they would know that they have a church family and they have a whole host of people cheering them on that have gone on ahead to heaven before us father that are rooting for them and so god i pray that you would just give us a a wonderful sense of your presence here this morning and i pray that you would calm nerves uh, that always exist at times like this in the candidates and we just want to give you glory and honor for what's accomplished and we ask all of these things in your name amen and so what I would ask is those that are being uh, baptized this morning, if you could come ahead up to six, and uh, maybe the younger ones are going to go first, so I need to have up here first, and then the rest of you, if you want to, to sit down, and Tracy's going to be joining me in the water uh, later on for Jacob and Alexa. Just give us a moment to make some transitions here. Ephraim, why don't you come? The things that I like to do is give give uh, people an opportunity to, to share about their, their walk with Jesus, and I told Ephraim it doesn't have to be long, it can be short and sweet. So, Ephraim, can you tell me a little bit about when you gave your heart to Jesus? It was back on um, February 17th, in the dining room, and listening to the sermon wow. in January. And when the sermon is was done, what did you ask your parents? I can get saved. Isn't that cool? How much more of a precious moment and a reminder to all of us of, of taking those times, right? So Ephraim, with, with God being your helper, do you intend to follow Jesus for the rest of your life? Move right over here if you want, Ephraim. All right, Liam. So this is a special day for me and for us, for Michelle and I, um, to be able to, to baptize all three kids in the same day is, is a pretty awesome thing. Liam said to me earlier this week, he said, I don't get it, I don't see the big deal, when I told him how amazing it was, but I think he's started to understand the hugeness of it. Can you tell me, Liam, you can be as short as sweet as what Ephraim was too. Can you tell me about when you invited Jesus into your heart? I was in my bedroom one night when I was doing my prayers, and you and mom were in here, and I wanted to ask Jesus into my heart. Isn't that kind of neat? And I think the exact question you asked us is, how could you make sure that when you died, you'd go to heaven, right? Yeah. And you were six, maybe, when you did that? Seven? Seven? Seven, yeah. six. And have you always remembered that commitment you made? Yes. And Liam, with God being your helper, do you intend to follow Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes. 
<laughs> Jacob's the one that really loves to be up front. <laughs> so I, I, I asked him to do a five minute talk <laughs> about what it meant to be justified and redeemed. I didn't do that, did I? Can you tell us a little bit about when you gave your heart to Jesus? Uh, I was at a uh, nursing home with mom and dad, and I asked mom what happened after death, and she told me, and I prayed with her, and asked Jesus into my heart. So when your pastor's kids, one of the places you hang out a lot are nursing homes and hospitals. <laughs> and uh, our kids even found out how to make friends in, in uh, hospital um, waiting rooms because I would leave them in the in the, the area where they could eat and do all of that. And I never knew who would be sitting down chatting with them when I came out from visiting. But I was in visiting a lady that her, her days were coming to an end very quickly. And it's just, again, take those moments, take those times have those conversations. Jacob, with God being your helper, do you intend to follow Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes. Alexa is not the hugger in our family, <laughs> so this is bothering her right now, and I know that it is. <laughs> so I shouldn't be doing that, right? Alexa, can you tell us about when you invited Jesus into your heart? Youth camp at my home camp in 2014. And do you remember anything that was talked about that night? Do you remember who was the speaker that year? I don't know. Maybe. Do you remember what was talked about and what's kind of worked in your heart that night for you to do that? Doing what God wants you to regardless of the people who tell you it's wrong or it's not all right. One of the neat things that happens when you, we happen to be living close to, to where I grew up is Alexa made that decision at the same camp where I felt God call me into ministry for the first time. And so that was a, a special moment uh, when she came home and shared that. Alexa, with God being your helper, do you intend to follow Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes. Derek, a few months ago you stopped in at the church and asked me one of my most favorite questions to be asked. He said, uh, sometime when you're doing a baptize, baptism service, I'd like to be baptized. And then you shared a little bit about uh, when God had, uh, when you had invited God, uh, Jesus into your heart and forgive you. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about when that was and what stirred within your heart? It was uh, December the 8th, 2010, it was about six years ago now. Um, it was at a service at the church. It, um, it was, it was. Uh, they had singers here one time, and it, I was living in DP at the time. Uh, it was at, and I said to the Lord there. So, if you listen to what's been going on this morning, we have one that did it at his, his at his living room table or their dining room table. One that did it in his bedroom one that did it at a camp, one that did it in the backseat of a car of a nursing home, and now Derek who accepted Jesus in the church because of some singers. But somewhere along the line, do you remember the, who the singers were? I think it, um, I think it's what their name was, uh, Lumber, or, Lumber I, River? I think it was. Okay, so Lumber River. But they, they was there at uh, different times. Yep. Well, we're glad you've decided and you made that prayer of commitment six years ago and you've been living out your faith. Derek, with God being your helper, do you intend to follow Jesus for the rest of your life? Yeah. Linda, we've had some chats together over the last couple of years and you've walked through a lot with your mom and uh, different things and with your son and Linda and Rick. Linda and Peter's son is here with them that we've been praying for. I don't want to point him out or do anything like that. <laughs> I won't do that to you. Um, but I know you're so happy to have get some of your family here today. Linda, can you tell us a little bit about when you, you first began to feel like, I, I need to make this real and uh, invite Jesus to, to follow Jesus wholeheartedly? I think it was when uh, Mom was in the hospital.
and I was on the, I felt like I was on a journey with God at that time, and with my mom passing away and her son, and then her son getting cancer, and I felt like God gave me the hope and the strength to know that Kyle was going to win this battle with cancer, and that I wanted to recommit myself to Jesus today by being baptized in his name. So again, another story of life's challenges and how God can speak into our hearts and lives. Linda, with God being your helper, do you intend to follow Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes, I do. So one at a time, uh, we're going to the same order, if you can remember that, guys, the same order that we just did. I'm going to invite you to come down. And uh, I'm looking for Tracy. There's a, Tracy, when we land into uh, Jacob, I guess, if you want to join us down there. You know, one of the things we prayed about, and some of you, my wife is going to say you've talked too much, and she'll tell me that on the way home. But one of the things we prayed about when we came here is that God would give our kids and our teens a competent youth leader. And some of you are saying, okay, where is he? <laughs> See, I knew some of you were thinking about that. But Tracy's been such a blessing for our life and for our kids' life. We had gone through a journey at in Ontario with a youth group that uh, Alexa and Jacob were attending um, without going into a lot of details. There's something, when you worry what the safety of your kids when they're going off to youth events, and what it's just not not a neat feeling at all. And uh, with all of Tracy's carry, uh, craziness and all of that, there's no doubt that he cares for uh, our teens and your teens and has such a heart and love for them. And so I've invited, I asked our kids first if that was all right and they wanted that. Of course, they felt it was they did, like they were maybe shunning me if they if Tracy came down and said no we're all in this uh, together and so Tracy's going to join us uh, for the teens and uh, that'll be that'll be good so we're going to walk down and so this is kind of we're going to have to change posture a little bit but that's all right I would invite all of you if you're able to kind of move down around here so you can be able to see better and uh, you might be able to, to hear a little better and then once I'm all done baptizing Linda I'll have a closing prayer we'll pray for the food and uh, then we'll just uh, be able to relax and enjoy uh, the lunch that's uh, getting ready over there. So just uh, move, move around. Uh, the team is going to sing a song as we're doing we're... <laughs> you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Dead to sin, alive to Christ. You guys will sing. <laughs>
Jacob Craven. It's my privilege as your father to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Dead to sin. Alive to Christ. Stay for lunch. Um, that's that's great. Don't be in a hurry to leave them. Take a chance.